All right, thank you. You hear me? Yep. Okay, thank you. Well, nice to be with you today. Uh, my name is Ole Haldorsson. I am located in the northeastern part of Iceland. I'm the director of a small academic educational research center here in the northeast. It's called Husavik Academic Center. Husavik is my hometown. Probably most famous, if some of you have heard about Husavik, it's probably something to do with whales, whale watching. Uh, we call ourselves sometimes the whale watching capital of Iceland or even Europe, if you are very optimistic. Uh, I'm a director of this research center, and uh, and I've also I was also a chairman in a congress committee on the Highland National Park. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the national parks and uh, sustainable tourism, with a special focus on the Highland National Park project in Iceland. Uh, next slide, please. Today's subjects are divided in four parts. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about just a few words about national parks, why we do want national parks uh, and uh, for whom they are, who need them or who, who use them. And the second part, uh, a little bit about local communities in national parks and on the edges of the national parks and how, how they affect the local communities. And then, and probably spend most of my minutes in the on the Highlands National Park in Iceland. Tell you a little bit about the park itself and the project and uh, what's it about. Then a few few points in the end about uh, Iceland and the post-COVID uh, post-COVID area and the and the sustainable tourism uh, after COVID. So next slide, please. Uh, why national parks? Obviously, I'm not going to go in any details. Uh, I'm not going to lecture you about national parks. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, uh, it's, it's, uh, it is useful to begin with this question. Why do we establish national parks just as the Highland National Park in Iceland? What are they supposed to do, national parks? Uh, a few of the aims uh, are here on the slide. You can see it's just a few of the key aims of, of national parks. Very brief overview, just a few of the goals of national parks overall. The first of all, obviously, conservation of nature. Uh, national parks are obviously always a holistic approach to protection. It's a protection of an area, of a land, not one particular natural phenomenon, although sometimes the natural phenomenon in the middle is the key focus, but usually it is about a large area or an area that's protected as a, as a whole bit. Uh, conservation of some environmental features or properties of this particular land. So this is obviously the most common one and the, the one that we all of us think about when we think about national parks. But the second one is also very important and in some countries it's actually just as important or even more important, which is the protection of cultural heritage. And in Iceland, we have more, obviously most focus on the, the first one, conservation of nature. We have got a lot of land, a lot of uninhabited land. Uh, so the nature is sort of the, the thing in Iceland. But in many other countries, for especially UK, England and Scotland, you can see that many of you probably know these parks better than myself. But the national parks in England and Scotland are many of them focused very much on protection of cultural heritage, the historical monuments and, and buildings or structures of historical importance, historical land and, and the landscape and even villages within the parks. And in Iceland, we actually have one such park. We have Thingvellir National Park, which is close to Reykjavik, a small one, rather one, but, but it's uh, one of the key things in Thingvellir is not the nature, although it's, it's brilliant nature in Thingvellir. It's, uh, it is rather the uh, uh, protection of the, or well, conservation of historical monuments and the Democratical uh, history of Iceland that happens near Thingvellir. So the 
historical monuments and, and the historical landscape in Tinkwedler is, is just as important as the natural things. So we do have an example of that in Iceland. Uh, the third point, which is probably the oldest one or, or that started the national parks internationally, which is the uh, sort of recreation or outdoors activity. So it's probably what started the national parks in American national parks in the beginning and the uh, uh, very important one. Uh, the two last one are, are more uh, on practical goals to promote sustainable use of natural resources, to manage the use of, of the land towards sustainable development. Uh, and then we can look at it both from environmental point of view, environmental conservation, but also to promote sustainable business development within the area. The fifth one is uh, the most recent one, you can say, that uh, you will see in the probably last two or three decades in, in the formation of national parks internationally. And here in Iceland, in very good, uh, can get a good case study here in Iceland in the most recent national park in Iceland, that this particular thing to promote and strengthen the local settlement is one of the key aims or goals of the national park. So it's just a brief overview of what, what they are for, just to prepare you for the uh, Highland Park. Uh, next, please. So for whom uh, are these national parks? It's very important as, as well to, to uh, bear that in mind, who are using national parks. Uh, a very simplified version of a co very complicated and long history of national parks uh, worldwide would be to say that in the beginning, the first big old, mainly American national park, it was used as a playfield or playground for, for the rich people in the cities. <laughs> A very simplified version, but still uh, national parks were formed as a, as a place for people to use for recreation and uh, to to get an out, outdoor playground for, for people that could do it. Obviously not used by farmers or the working classes uh, uh, at, the, at, the, at this time, but then later on this changes. A lot has happened and if we skip one century or so, we can say that today national parks are used uh, mainly by tourists. Uh, and in most countries, the highest number of guests in national parks are foreign tourists. In Iceland, definitely, and in, in most countries as well. These are foreign tourists that are, get the highest number of guests in national parks. Uh, local people as well, uh, local tourists uh, and traveling around their own country. And uh, then local businesses making use of the national park for marketing and uh, creating a, an image for, for their local area. Then we cannot forget to say that some people obviously say that nature itself, its intrinsic value of nature is, should be, always be the key point in, in, uh, in these terms. Well, next please. If we go uh, to the next chapter, we can say that about local communities, a few things about that. There are, of course, always things that develop uh, some sort of a tension between the conservational nature of national parks and the utilitarian nature of the uh, local communities with their ways of making a living near or in the national parks. This tension, you can find that in every national park. Uh, the local communities versus the national park authorities sometimes, but but of course, in, in many cases, they do agree on the main key issues. Uh, but there are different interests and there are different issues uh, and uh, a room for subjective evaluation and opinions of many kinds in these national parks. Uh, we got very good examples of that in, in all of the discussion around Highland, the Highland National Park project in Iceland. Uh, are we so? Are we allowed to hunt? Are we allowed to shoot ptarmigans or geese or or reindeer, or uh, can we drive this path or that road? Uh, can we build, can the national power pump company build big hydropower dams, new ones? Are we uh, also the geothermal dams or the geothermal power plants? 
and the power lines is an issue in Iceland. All these different tensions, you can find them and you can find them in the highland in Iceland and in most of the other countries, different issues, but same, same key, key factors. But all these different interests uh, make a, a huge argument, I say for myself, for the need for some kind of mechanism or a management tool for these areas. Because before you, before uh, a national park, and for example, in the highlands of Iceland, uh, you have 25, around 25 ish uh, municipalities, and uh, not with any synchronization of, of land policy use for, for these areas. So just 25 different municipalities. Uh, suggesting maybe different things in the same area. So it's a, all these tensions make uh, make a, an argument for some management tools. Uh, next, please. Uh, if we simplify this very much, a very simplified version, uh, we could say that the different approaches to the management of the national parks, you can find it in these two to very different things. You'll find the top-down approach within national park, usually owned by the state or run by the state, uh, deciding the, all the key things, uh, and the policy being made at the top. Uh, sometimes you'll find these restrictions and bans, what you can do and what you can't do, and it is decided in the beginning. This is sort of how we did the national parks uh, a century ago and a few de decades ago, and we can find examples of that in Iceland, that national parks were formed and around some boundaries, and the uh, national park authorities, which was run by the state, decided all the key things beforehand. This is what you can do, this is what you can't do. Uh, the other, on the other side of the spectrum is the bottom-up approach, which is a decentralized version that the na national park itself is managed by the stakeholders and the communities. And decisions and the, and the policy is not made before, but it's made just as time goes by. Obviously, with some key aims and some key issues, that, do, that you are regulated in the beginning. This is sort of what the aims of the parks are, and you, you have to be work within them. But still, uh, the decision on whether or where to use shoot ptarmigans or, or herd sheep is made as you go on. Different things and all, all possible ways between, but the, you can see that these are uh, the, the two main types. Uh, next, please. So, the Highland National Park in Iceland, just a few facts, so you know what I'm talking about. Uh, it is Iceland's middle. You can see it on the map here behind, on, on the slides. It's a green part, green bit. It is the middle of Iceland. It's around 30% of the whole of Iceland, this uh, project, this uh, Highland National Park. But it is uh, uninhabited highlands. There is no one living in the highlands of Iceland. It's it's high on high from sea level. It's three to six, seven hundred meters. Most of the most of the area and up to much higher in, in, in mountains and glaciers. So it's uninhabited and it would be the largest national park in Europe. Next, please. But not everyone that looks into the Highland National Park project uh, realizes that uh, this national park, it, it's, it's not completely new because there is already a huge Highlands National Park in Iceland in this area, which is called Vatnajökull. Vatnajökull is the name of the biggest glacier. Vatnajökull, you can see that in, within the yellow line. And uh, one way to look at the Highland National Park project is to say that you are extending or doubling the, the Vatnajökull Glacier National Park to the West Highlands. So you are more or less supersizing or doubling the, uh, the national park that we already have to cover the, all of the uh, center of Iceland. But one very important thing is that this project uh, is 
is uh, the law, the, well, the law that's being debated at the moment, says that it is absolutely decentralized management. It is local governance uh, program with uh, local authorities and the municipalities, the NGOs, farmers union, the tourism sector, everyone at the board uh, managing the park itself. Not only for advice, but uh, being the real part of the national park governance, making the decisions. So it is a decentralized management uh, project that covers the middle of Iceland uh, in one whole bit. Next, please. The idea has been discussed in Iceland for, well, many, many years. Uh, I will say here on this slide, 2010-ish, uh, real discussion started. Uh, NGOs took the, the case and, and, and make, did some seminars and, and con congresses on this. And uh, so it started the discussion just a decade ago, but 2016 was the first official committee being put by the Ministry of the Environment. 2016, uh, 2017, there was a policy, governmental policy on Highlands National Park that simply said that uh, before the end of 2021, this Highland Park will be established. Uh, 2018, the second official committee was established, and that was, that's the committee I chaired. Uh, it took uh, worked for one and a half year, and we finished our report in 2019. And at the moment, uh, the Congress here in Iceland is debating and discussing uh, this proposal. And the, uh, some of us are hoping that this will be established and finished in 2021, this spring or for the summer. It has developed in the years, but but still the key issues have remained the same. It is uh, it is uh, the middle of Iceland, uh, decentralized, and and the key issues similar, although although it has developed. Next, please. Uh, one important thing about the Highland of Iceland, uh, and not not everybody, not not even the local people in Iceland realize this in the discussion on the Highland National Park, and it is being discussed very much at the moment. Uh, not everyone uh, realizes that all land in the Highland National Park, 100%, is publicly owned. There is no inch of the uh, within the boundaries of this national park that will be owned by privately. There's, there's no land taken from anyone, it's just the, the public land or national land, and there's a special law in Iceland about public land, national land, and uh, every single bit of the middle of Iceland within these boundaries is owned by the people. So it is uh, one way to one way to put the this uh, describe the project, Highland National Park project, would be to say that it is a decentralized mechanism to manage the people's land in a sustainable way. That would be one way to put it. Next, please. Uh, here we can see, if we move on to post-COVID area and the tourism, although uh, Tourism is not, not my speciality here. Elias uh, had a good introduction about the tourism here before me. Uh, before COVID, we had around 2 million tourists per year, as has been said before. We got these high density places or spots, uh, overcrowding issues. And in some place, uh, the danger of uh, decline of the natural resources. Uh, and if we go put it in business terms, the product decline or possibility of a product decline and then the decline of the business. Furthermore, uh, these po photos here, although uh, these two here on the left are actually not mine, every other in this slideshow are mine photos, but these two are not mine. Uh, they're taken uh, from in Lake Miva, the upper one, which is one of these overcrowded areas at some, some points during the summer, especially the last few years. Lake Mevatn is in the northeast of Iceland, near, near where close to my place. And we can see 
that it's a quite common to see something like that. Hundreds of people in the same spot uh, and, and not very good infrastructure to deal with it. The lower one on the left side is from Thingvellir National Park, the one I described before, and you can see that as well. It's very close to Reykjavik, so it's uh, so it's quite easy to reach. So it gets a lot of lots of tourists, and sometimes they queue up and 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 uh, queues like that. Uh, the photo on the right side, uh, I took it myself this uh, at the end of June last summer, and it is interesting because this is uh, the famous Fjallraglúur which is a place in the southeast of Iceland and, and the boundaries of the southeast highlands in Iceland. It's a place that got its minute of fame or more than minutes. It's, it's really it's famous, at the, still famous. And uh, Justin Bieber's music video full of and has been full of tourists after that. But this photo is taken around midnight uh, at the end of June. And it's the time of the year where there's almost no difference between day and night in Iceland. But what is interesting about the photo is that there are really no tourists. It's just in the middle of COVID. Uh, this just before the, uh, well, there was a gap in the COVID here in Iceland where we could travel a little bit before we got the, got the latest wave of, of COVID restrictions. Uh, we started moving around and I went there with my family and there was absolutely no tourists. Not a single car, not a bus, not nothing. The only thing we could hear was the river running in the canyon. So it is a good example of what what things, what the product, the the, the natural phenomenon there, can provide very different experience with thousands or hundreds of people around you, or just by yourself. Uh, next, please. Well, I'm reaching an end here. Well, no, I forgot a little bit. Yes, sorry, one up again, one back, one slide back, please. Yes, we got here. Yeah, uh, I forgot to say just it, uh, these photos here and this experience leaves us with a question whether we can expect less numbers of tourists, uh, maybe better management or encourage us to manage better the, the tourists, uh, distribute them how, however we can do that around the, around the country and uh, strengthen the infrastructure. And actually the Highland National Park, from my point of view, is a very, one very big infrastructure strengthening in Iceland. It's a, it's a way to deal with a very big part of the country and, and make a mechanism where everybody can can have their say in a decentralized management system to prepare for what to come the next year yes next please yes i'm reaching an end uh, uh, so the question if we look at it in these two very different ways are uh, or is this development that we have been uh, experiencing and Elias uh, told us about the numbers very well before me. Is this uh, some sort of irreversible collapse of tourism? Uh, all numbers down, spendings down. Will we ever get it back? Uh, communities are they are they hurt so badly that they are not going to not going to go back where they were? Businesses down, etc. Is it the, uh, that sort of the negative way to look at it? But or is there a is there a sun somewhere behind the fog? Uh, this photo on the left is taken in in a, in a famous mountain road in Iceland, which is called Öxi. Looks like a, a terrible path in the highlands, but it's actually one of Iceland's key roads in the eastern part of Iceland. Uh, so that's the other thing. The other way to look at it is to ask whether there is, there are some great opportunities in the future. Uh, this hard reset of the tourism sector, painful as it is, uh, will it uh, encourage us to do the tourism business more sustainable with less numbers, and not perhaps not focus on the numbers, more on the enjoyment and more on the spendings and businesses. So the question, uh, yes, uh, the next please, the last one is simply this the remaining question is less more, or if we, if we rephrase it, we could say, will less tourists 
with stronger infrastructure and the Highland National Park post COVID lead to better and more sustainable tourism in Iceland. So that could be the, would be the question and I'll leave, leave that question in the end. Thank you very much.